Hi, Galen. Hi, Bob. How are you? Fine. Good. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available in both streaming video and as an audio podcast. You're Galen Strawson, distinguished uh, philosopher. You you uh, are a professor of philosophy at the University of Texas um, in Austin. Not far from where I went to high school, by the way, but I digress. We're going to talk about, um, well, some pretty heavy-duty things. Uh I guess, uh, you know, the the book of yours that this is most relevant to probably is Consciousness and Its Place in Nature. Does physicalism entail panpsychism? But I fear that we may scare people off with that title. So let me say more concretely, we're going to talk about the fact that it's like something to be alive. Maybe that makes it sound more accessible. I also want to mention you've got a a, a book that's going to come out called Things That Bother Me. Indeed. And I've got to say, if I wrote a book called Things That Bother Me, it would be longer than this one. <laughs> but uh, yours, on the other hand, is subtitled Death, Freedom, The Self, etc. So you seem to be confining it to the really important things that bother you. Um, uh, I'll have a volume two in due course. Yeah, okay. I, I, I hope so. Um, things, things That Bother Me doesn't mean all the things that bother me. Good, good. <laughs> so you should change it to a, a few of the many things that bother me. Then. <laughs> Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, as I suggested, we're going to try to get to the bottom of the mind-body problem or, uh, you know, talk about uh, consciousness. Um, and you have, I mean, first of all, let me say, uh, there's a view that I think people are hearing more and more about called panpsychism, uh, and the idea there is that... Uh, consciousness in some sense uh, pervades reality. There's some kind of consciousness uh, over there where my curtains are, only a little tiny bit, maybe, but there's some. And that's gotten a lot of attention. And it, and it's a view that uh, you subscribe to, I think, but then you throw in a twist uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, add the word physicalist, Meaning, uh, well, we'll talk about what you mean. So, so you have a, uh, a, a distinctive, I think a pretty distinctive view. Um, and I, I wanna, I, I think I wanna approach it by first of all, uh, getting clear on what you mean by physicalism. Now, am I right in thinking that that has come to be the term that philosophers used for what might have also been called at one time materialism. Like people have heard scientific materialism and they think of the idea that, or materialism, the idea that all there is is physical stuff, right? But now philosophers use the word physicalism for that. Is that right? Yes, I, yes, I think it is right. And I, I certainly use it in that way. Some philosophers mean more by, by physicalism than that. They, they tend also to mean something like physics will tell us everything there is to tell about reality, and that's a mistake, in my view. Yeah, I was just thinking about that today. I was just realizing that, like, science gives us everything we need to manipulate reality, but not but not all we need to understand reality. Correct. Yeah, that's what I think. You agree? <laughs> well, yes, I do. And, you know, not, not for any... I think of myself as a very passionate and committed naturalist. So it's not as if I have any odd um, agenda that I... I mean, I'm also an atheist, so I don't believe in any kind of God, and I don't have any sort of New Age type of aspirations. I think that I'm forced into the position I hold by precisely because I want to have an entirely naturalistic attitude to reality. Right. Now, a thing about materialism is that when you really start thinking about it, it's hard, or physicalism, it's harder to define than you might think. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you first hear it, you think, well, okay, so it's all physical stuff. You could reach out and touch it. It's there. There's nothing spooky. There's no, you know, kind of supernatural forces. But then you, you know, realize that physics, you know, the, the deeper physics penetrates reality, the more you wonder whether you know, in what sense there is physical stuff there, if you know what I mean? I mean, does that make sense? Yes, it does. If you mean that the, the old picture of little 
tiny grainy bits of stuff. I mean, that's been, that was wiped out a hundred years ago. Um, there aren't any such things, or it seems. Right. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we think of atoms as these physical things, but they turn out to consist of these other things, which consist of these other things. And it's not clear that there's anything at the bottom other than in a certain sense, math, right? I mean, <laughs> does that make sense? Uh, well, yeah, but even there, I think you have to be careful not to have a, a kind of an over, um, substantive, over solid picture of what that is. There just seem to be patterns in fields like the electromagnetic field. And that's really all there is. There are no grainy little bits, even at the very bottom. Right. And, and in fact, I mean, one feature of quantum physics or one thing quantum physics tells us is that once you get down to the level of the electron, things start getting pretty weird and there are, there are times when uh, it's not clear that it's either a – well, it's e it may be both a particle and a wave, which seems contradictory, or it may be neither until you measure it or, or, or something, or maybe a probability wave until you measure it and then you, you turn – you know, it, 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 when you get down the, to the smaller so-called particles, things get really weird. Yes. And, and so thinking of them as, you know, the question of whether electrons actually exist in any intuitively clear sense is is kind of an open question, right? Yes. I think a lot of people think that we shouldn't even think of them as things. They're just vibratory patterns in, in fields. Right. Maybe. So, I mean, in light of this, doesn't it uh, – mightn't it make you reluctant to even use terms like materialism uh, or physicalism? Uh, no, because I mean, I'm right there with the, it's very much the physicists themselves who are saying these sorts of things. Yeah. They're the ones who are saying, I mean, actually Russell, one of my heroes here, Russell said a thousand, no, sorry, a hundred years ago that <laughs> physics has become as ghost, I'm quoting, physics has become as ghostly as anything in a spiritualist seance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's Bertrand Russell. Yep. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I was thinking that maybe what you what you mean if you say you're a materialist is that you think uh, everything in the universe uh, complies with laws. Is that? Yeah, except uh, I have. That's the trouble with talking to a philosopher. I have so many troubles with so many words. I don't want. I don't think of stuff as complying with laws. I think of laws as not in no way separate from the stuff itself. But let me try to answer your question more directly. What I really think is that there's, first of all, my, my materialism amounts to thinking there's only one kind of stuff. And that's, and indeed, that physics says a lot of true things about it. That's what I think. Okay, now, uh, I don't want to quite get to what you think this stuff is, because I think that may, uh, uh, that may sound a little too weird to people at this point in the conversation. I mean, okay. it gets at this paradox of your being, of this, the term physicalist and, uh, panpsychism, um, you know, being a, a physicalist panpsychist. But, uh, I, I want to say one more thing about this idea of materialism and, and, uh, so-called physicalism. Um, the, uh, I, I have a friend who's a, who's a philosopher at Princeton and I was asking him about this. I was saying, well, what is in light of the fact that, you know, the physical stuff itself seems elusive. The deeper you get, the weirder the math gets. What does it mean to say you're a materialist or a physicalist? He said he thinks it's a way of signaling that there are two things you're not, that you are not teleological, that is to say you don't believe in some overarching or larger purpose, and you are not a moral realist. That uh, That is to say you don't believe that moral, uh, you know, moral laws are kind of so out there. So... It's almost uh, a weird form of signaling rather than uh, a, a school of thought that has much to do with the, the term that's being invoked, right? Yeah. Um, no, well, I, I am actually am some sort of moral realist. I just regard that as a separate issue. Okay, uh, so you are I a moral realist. Think, so I would disagree with him that you're signaling that if you say you're a physicist. So I will correct I, you. Um, yeah, so that's one point. Okay, so... But Real key, I mean, one of the real keys is you think there's only one kind of stuff. Um, you're a monist in, in, the, in, the, in the language of philosophy. There's only one kind of stuff. You're not a dualist 
as, for example, famously Descartes, who thought that there was physical stuff on the one hand and then there was immaterial mental stuff on the other hand. You think there's only one kind of stuff. Right. And you are not a dualist. I am not a dualist. Um, on the other hand, you do take consciousness uh, seriously. Yeah, I, I, more than that. <laughs> it's just, it's the only thing... We, Okay, perhaps each of us knows for certain that he or she exists, fine. But the only other general thing we know for certain is that consciousness exists. And what's so weird about um, philosophy in, in America and the UK, for example, at the moment, is that some people actually deny that consciousness exists. And they deny it because they define themselves as physicalists. And some of them think that if you are a physicalist, you cannot be a realist about consciousness. And that's precisely what I want to reject. Now, ironically, some of them not only deny that they den that, that consciousness exists, they also deny that they're denying that consciousness exists. They do. They do. And they do that by really, in effect, redefining it. So they, say, they, they will say that consciousness is just, as it were, being able to operate effectively in an environment or something. And um, it's, a, it's a functional property. And I would say in return, no, that just leaves out everything that matters about consciousness. In fact, you can build a robot, which we can assume not to have consciousness, and it can operate effectively, but precisely it isn't conscious. Right. Now, do you think we should name some names here? Uh, sure. Okay, go, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I think I can guess. I think I can guess, but, yeah, but um, yeah, my my arch enemy. I mean, my friend, but my arch enemy in this particular respect is Dan Dennett. He sort of leads the tribe of those who, in my view, deny the existence of consciousness, although they will not agree that that is what they do. Right. I, I accused him of that in a footnote of, of basically having a view that's tantamount to denying that consciousness exists, and I got I got like he, he was not happy with me. Yes. Funnily enough, I've just read a long piece by someone called Keith Frankish. It's called Illusionism as a Theory of Consciousness, mm -hmm. and he's very much in the same camp. And he does he does actually come out and say that he's denying the existence of consciousness. And here's another. The only other person I know who's done it recently is, interestingly again, is Jay Garfield, who's a Buddhist scholar. And Jay Garfield and, and another man, Buddhist scholar called... And Mark Sideret seem to think that it's actually part of the Buddhist position. But for me, that can't be right, because what, you know, what matters most in, in one respect in Buddhism is compassion for suffering. And you can't have suffering if there isn't consciousness. Right. Why, why would you care about the well-being of uh, yes. sentient beings if it weren't like anything to be a sentient being? Exactly. And yet <laughs> there you are. You just used that famous phrase, something it's like to be, the phrase that was made famous by Thomas Nagel in his paper, what is it like to be a bat? Right. And this is uh, this is what I always say to people who seem to be acting as if consciousness isn't doesn't exist or even isn't a challenging thing. They're like, what's the you know, I say, well, is it like something to be you? I've never heard anybody say no. And 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 I say, well, is it like something to be that wall? And they tend to say no. Now here they're different from you, maybe <laughs> we'll get into that, but but in any event, it's a phrase, uh Defining consciousness as kind of the, the you know the just just saying the criterion for consciousness being that it's like something to be you is I think a, a, a clarifying thing uh, for some people. Now, by the way, both uh, Keith Frankish and Jay Garfield have been on this uh, show. Oh. Kind of, I've had conversations with them, and you're right that Keith Frankish was very uh, forthright. It used to be, I think, more common to just come out and say, if you, uh, for philosophers, say I. I don't believe uh, consciousness exists. Wasn't that Gilbert Ryle's position, or or, or not? Uh, I have. I really can't say. I mean, I think his famous book, The Concept of Mind, right, is is um, not consistent. Okay, so that so he came up with the phrase "ghost in the machine," right? And and uh, in in in, uh, in a derisory way, I guess the the idea being that to believe in consciousness, believe. Uh, that there's kind of ghost in the machine. Okay, so with that uh, as preface, let's get back to, first of all, panpsychism, the view you subscribe to, and the view that, again, you hear more and more about it, seems. But you distinguish between two kinds of 
panpsychism, a kind of a weak form and a kind of a strong form. And I think you subscribe to the strong form. Uh, and then in fact, there's a stronger form of the strong form, but we'll get to that. The, 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 the generic description again is, is that, is that, and I'm reading really from your own writing, is that panpsychism is the view that mind or consciousness is present in all of reality. That's literally pan meaning, you know, uh, all and, uh, and, and psyche meaning, um, you know, mind or consciousness. Uh, now, now, what you call a weaker form is, is I think basically the only form I had heard about. And it's, and it's, it's, I think the more commonly expressed. And, and you, you, you quote the Oxford English, English dictionary saying that it's the view that there is an element of consciousness in all matter. So it's almost like, uh, there's an interior to, to all matter, uh, or something. There's a kind of a subjective interior or a subjective side you don't see. To all matter. Th- that's the the version of panpsychism I have most often heard. I- I- and is it? Do you think the most commonly expressed form? Um, these days, I'm not sure. I, is it? Would it be okay if I took a step back? Sure. Yeah. Um, it's just that what, a question that arises when you when you encounter the views of people like Dan Dennett and Keith Frankish is, why are they saying this? What is motivating them to deny something that seems obviously to exist? And the answer is because they define themselves as materialists or physicalists. And they think that if you think that everything is physical, uh, you cannot think that there is phenomenal qualitative consciousness. So that's, uh, that's meant to be the kind of twist in my saying I'm a physicalist. I'm saying I agree with you. Dan and Keith, that everything is physical, but I don't think that that rules out the reality of consciousness. And then there's one more move, I'm sorry, to, to this is a big step back, which is to say, please don't think that physics gives us any reason to think that consciousness isn't as real as we ordinarily take it to be, because physics is just a matter of equations, and it doesn't tell us about the ultimate intrinsic nature of matter. It leaves that open. So the way is open for being an outright realist about consciousness and a physicalist. So I reject their their very starting point, which is commitment to physicalism and the belief that that gives them reason to be somehow less than realist about consciousness. That's that's the sort of dialectic of it all. I mean, I do uh I do appreciate the challenge they may see in reconciling what we think of as, as physicalism or materialism with a belief uh that consciousness is real, because I mean if consciousness I mean it is a noun, consciousness. So if oh. you think of it as a kind of a stuff Oh no. Well yeah. it's not physical stuff, apparently. So so uh, well, I mean, I know you, you may okay. disagree, but I mean the intuitive the intuitive notion would certainly be that like you know uh my consciousness if we're gonna use it, you know, as a noun like that, um if it refers to a kind of stuff, the common intuition would be well that it's it's not a physical stuff. Now it may be totally determined by the physical stuff in your brain. It may entirely correlate with the physical movements in your brain, but uh, the consciousness per se, I mean, you can see the appeal of the idea that the consciousness per se is not physical, right? I, I can, but I'd say it was a mistake. Here the problem is that phys- the word physical is getting used in two ways. Uh, is One of them ties the word physical closely to the kind of thing that physics tells us about, and the other just uses it as a word for whatever is out there whatever its nature. And if you want to find people who define themselves as physicalists and think that consciousness is wholly physical, you know, look at some of the great physicists of the last century, like sort of Heisenberg and Schrodinger and and probably Einstein, although I don't quote me on that, and perhaps Planck also, certainly Whitehead. And all those people thought that everything was physical, but they thought that physics, the theory of physics, simply didn't have anything to say about the ultimate intrinsic nature of things. So that left room for them to say mm-hmm. the consciousness too is physical. Although of course it isn't like a a, a stone that you kick or mm-hmm. yeah. So right, so physics tells us how to manipulate the fundamental stuff of reality. It doesn't tell us what the fundamental stuff of reality is. It doesn't tell us it tells us quite a lot of things. It tells us that there are in my brain there are eight-ish things, that's oxygen, and there are seven-ish things, there are nitrogen atoms. It does lots of stuff with numbers and 
uh, structures and relations, mm -hmm. but it doesn't tell us about the, the nature of the stuff that it is describing in all those um, mathematical ways. Right. The thing we know, in my view, the only thing we know for sure about it is that sometimes it manifests as the kind of consciousness we're having right now. The physics manifests as that. No, no, no. The, the physical stuff manifests as that. That stuff. And physics gives us lots of really interesting uh -huh. structural mathematical descriptions uh -huh. of it. And, and your view is that the stuff, in some sense, always manifests in that way, even when it's not part of human well, brain. Yeah, if you want, I mean, I think we're getting back to where, <clears throat> I, I think, yeah, I mean, the argument for that is, is it, he, I'll try and set it out as an argument. So step one is, well, look, one thing we know for sure is that consciousness is real. Step two, this is an assumption, technically. I, I, want, I believe there's only one kind of stuff, and I call it physical stuff. So I'm a physicalist, and I know that consciousness is real. So I have to say that consciousness is physical. That's step three. Mm -hmm. And then the question, then there's a, a move that some people question, which is to uh, relates to something called radical emergence, which maybe we should talk about soon. I, here's consciousness. I know what it is. I know what it's like. I don't think that you could arrange mere non-conscious physical stuff in such a way that that stuff would spring into existence. That would be, that would be what we call radical emergence. It would be like getting, I don't know, getting concrete things out of abstract things. And since I don't believe in radical emergence, the springing out of, springing up of consciousness from something utterly non-conscious, I have to think that it's up there at the bottom already. That's the motivation for panpsychism. Here's consciousness, this thing we know. Um, we couldn't get it from the utterly unconscious, so it must be at the bottom. Now, you could question that second step. The step says we couldn't get it from the utterly unconscious, and some people do. Yeah, and in fact, I think a common view is that certain configurations of matter Notably, those that maybe qualify as information processing in, in some sense that, uh, um, that, that, that may be the threshold when, uh, physical stuff starts manifesting as consciousness. Now, there are issues with that. I mean, one, one question is, well, isn't the physical world in some sense always an information processing system? You can wrestle with that. But, um, but, but, but certainly a common view is that no, the physical stuff, uh, the raw material itself in its most uh, kind of primitive form is not uh, does not manifest as sentience or consciousness, but there's a threshold it can pass. A lot of people say it involves information processing, or some people would say particularly sophisticated information processing. But that's the, a key thing that you find implausible, that there's just some threshold. That's correct. And, I, and, I, and the truth is that there is no strong argument for that it's just it comes down to what we call intuition <laughs> that um and all, i mean I, I can then bolster it i can say to people who say well physical reality in its fundamental nature is non wholly non-conscious but consciousness arises when things get complicated in a certain way i can then say what what is your evidence for the existence of wholly non-conscious stuff why are you positing it mm -hmm. and a lot of people will say Oh, it's much more theoretically expensive or profligate to think that there's consciousness at the bottom of things. But that's just, that begs the question. It's just an assumption. It's, you, have, you have to admit, it's kind of, I know, I know, I realize Thomas Nagel said it's, it's really hard to say what it's like to be a bat, and yet we think it is like something to be a bat. That said, if you ask what is it like to be those curtains, isn't that a pretty, isn't it kind of challenging to imagine that it's like anything at all to oh, be my... I don't think there is anything it's like to be curtains. Oh, okay. So in <laughs> what sense is there that, consciousness associated with my curtains? Yeah, that, that's, um, that's something that people like to laugh about, and I'm happy to laugh with them. I don't think there's anything it's like to be a table or a chair. Uh, what I do think is, as it were, that the weave of energy stuff that they're made of, that is, is, as it were, consciousness resides in that. To, to think that... Um, to think that the stuff of which it's made involves consciousness, it doesn't entail that every piece, of, every particular clumping of it also is a subject of consciousness. That's no more plausible than thinking that a football team is a subject of consciousness because it's made of subjects of consciousness. Um, okay, but so then you do think, I mean, you're skeptical of a threshold uh, where on one side of it, the 
configuration of physical stuff doesn't manifest as consciousness. On the other side, it does. But you do acknowledge that there's a threshold. On one side, it doesn't manifest as, you know, like something to be it. And on the other side, it does manifest as like something to be it. Well, yeah, it's, it's, let's, perhaps I can put it like this. Let's assume something that I take not to be true. Let's assume that there really are little fundamental particles. Then about the table, I would say, I would have to say all of them, each of them is conscious, but the thing they constitute clumped together is not. It is not itself a subject of consciousness. So it's not as if, but, but everything it's made of is. So it's not as if I've got patches of the world that don't involve consciousness. The key move is that it's the table as a whole is not a separate extra subject of consciousness. I think well, right, this, because it, the table as a whole is just a man-made. It's just it's just our it's in a certain sense a perceptual construct. Well, that's correct. Yes, uh, uh, but it, you see, so I can say, oh, everything's made of consciousness. But not every every patch of it is itself a subject of consciousness. That's, that's perfectly coherent. Well, right, but you also don't think, uh, leave aside the, the whole table, you also don't think the little tiniest bits of it, you don't think it's like something to be them either, right? Well, uh, if, if, as I, I said, if I, if I thought there really were little bits at the very bottom of things, I'd probably have to say that. Oh, but you don't think there are little bits? Well, um, what, see... Here it's, here it's helpful to sort of engage in a bit of, as it were, lay physics, the kind of physics that people like, who read books about it, popular books about it, know. So what is the uh, electron made of? Well, in some sense, it's just as energy. It's a sort of, I think of it as sort of, you know, just a little buzzing thing of energy. And the idea is that, what is the nature of, the intrinsic nature of that over and above the things we know it does, the effects it has on other things, it's consciousness. That's the suggestion. The point is simply that it's a very uh, elegant and parsimonious theory because then we we don't we we haven't postulated any non-experiential stuff at all. Mm-hmm. And again, the only thing we know absolutely for certain is that there is consciousness. So why are we going out there and postulating that there's something? utterly non-conscious and then creating for ourselves a huge theoretical problem about how we get consciousness out of the non-conscious yeah okay so let's uh pause and go a little a, a little more through your um your kind of taxonomy of positions we've talked about the weak form of panpsychism you actually hold as people may gather to a stronger form and oh. you, you write in its strongest form pure panpsychism it's a view that mind is all there is to reality Mind is the stuff of reality, the stuff being of reality. Uh, Eddington puts it plainly. Now, is this the physicist Arthur Eddington, or this, who is this? Yeah, okay, I didn't know he was philosophically inclined. Eddington puts it plainly. Was he like? Uh, well, let me just quote. Eddington puts it plainly. Quote: "The stuff of the world is mind stuff." So this is pure panpsychism. Now you go on to clarify that when you say. Mind is all there is to reality. This isn't Barclay's kind of idealism where you're saying the buildings I see out there may not exist. They're only ideas. The buildings are out there. Uh, it, it, it's just that, well, go ahead. Finish my sentence. It's just that what? <laughs> well, no, they're, they're, it has absolutely nothing to do. This view has nothing to right. do with Barclayan idealism. Yeah, so the buildings are out there. And I, mean, I suppose... It's simplest for purposes of exposition right now to say, let's suppose there are these little bits. So I'm saying, all these little bits, what are they? They're kind of buzzings, like energetic buzzings, and each of them is a consciousness buzzing, and the building is built of that. And it's a building is not in any sense an idea in someone's mind, as in the Barclay scheme. It's really out there, and if all, you know, if all biologically evolved life was wiped out, they'd still be there. Okay. Um... What you know the uh, the old question: uh, if, if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it, uh, it, it did it still make a sound? Yeah, yeah it's a. I just, it's, I just, my view's got nothing to do with that. <laughs> okay. Do you, a, do you have a position on it though? <laughs> uh, um, 
In well, in Bark, uh, I don't want to get into Bark. Okay, here. okay, we'll leave uh, people. Uh, uh, we'll leave people in suspense about your view on that. Um, so you then go on to define pan experientialist as yes. the uh, the strongest version of pure panpsychism, I guess, which was itself the strongest form of panpsychism. You say according to to pan experience the pan experientialist version, consciousness or experience or experiencing or experientiality is all there is to reality. Uh, that sounds a lot like your, uh, your, your definition of pure panpsychism was it's the view that mind is all there is to reality. So what is the, uh, what is the distinction between the two? Well, I mean, mind is, a, is an abstract noun in a way. So really I want to make it, as it were, live. So mm-hmm. it's actual consciousness thing. It's actual experiencing is all there is. Okay. Uh, I mean, one, one way of addressing that would be thinking of Barclay. So Barclay thinks that there are these immaterial souls. He'd call them mind, but they wouldn't necessarily have to be experiencing all the time. Okay. Okay, so... Um, there is just conscious process, put it like that. That's, it, it's not a very important distinction. It's just okay. made for the sake of philosophers. Okay, you realize how this could lead someone to ask you, but wait a second, then aren't you saying it is like something to be everything? If you, if you, if you're saying, um, experiencing or experientiality is all there is to reality, right? And you say, well, those curtains are real, then wouldn't it seem as if there has to be experience in the curtains and not just experience of the curtains? Yeah, again, it would be all the little bits. So they're, they're, Maybe something it's like to be the little bits of my curtain. I, yeah, if I if I accepted the view that reality was ultimately made of little bits, I would have to say that. Okay. Uh, here's one way to put it: that uh, this kind of panpsychism, what it does is perform a kind of global replace on everything that physics talks about. So most people they think of. They think of an electron. They're happy with the idea that it's just kind of a process, a kind of energy, an energy process. And then they think it's a non-conscious energy process. And I just replace that with, no, it's an, it's a conscious energy process. The energy process is experiencing. So I just, I don't touch anything in physics. I simply replace the picture of energy that most people have. Okay. With the idea that this energy is somehow experiencing. That's it. Okay. Um, let me, by, by way of maybe clarifying the landscape here, uh, tell me if this is right. If you, if you go back to the weak form of panpsychism, uh, the idea that, you know, there's just an element of consciousness in all matter. So in other words, consciousness is kind of a, a function or almost a, a, an emanation of matter, but, 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 but not, not emanation. No, it was function I didn't like, but I see what you mean. Yeah, okay. It, but yeah. if if you read it that way, that is consistent with the view of human consciousness as epiphenomenal, right? Which is to say, I mean, maybe we should define epiphenomenalism, but the idea that my my consciousness is kind of uh, the relationship of my consciousness to my brain is kind of the relationship uh, of the shadow of my hand to the hand. The shadow doesn't do anything. It just mirrors the, where the actual action of my hand. Similarly, consciousness just mirrors the physical stuff. The, 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 this one soft view of panpsychism is consistent with this epiphenomenal view of human consciousness, right? Yes, it is. It's also, it's also, it also avoids what I call the radical emergence problem because it says at least, okay, it isn't all consciousness at the bottom, but right. at least there is consciousness out there, down there, and that's so it's less you don't need radical emergence to get human consciousness. Right. Uh, but I should just say in passing on epiphenomenalism, which is that's the view that consciousness is real, but it has no effects in the world. I do think that it's actually incoherent and actually false anyway. So <laughs> why, why do you think it's inco- I find it I kind of intuitively appealing. It just run. It, it, it ultimately uh, leads to the mystery of why consciousness is here if it doesn't do anything. But, but um, but why do you find it? I, I I find actually that a lot of people implicitly hold it. You know, in other words, they don't really think about consciousness, but they're 
they have like a very kind of scientific view of the world. And, 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 and in a way, a kind of epiphenomenalism is implied in the way they talk. So I think it's kind of an appealing view. Why do you think it's incoherent? I think it's incoherent because nothing can be, as I say, concretely real, part of the actual stuff of the universe without having effects or, or being affected by things. Um, that's, that's just a, an a priori intuition that to be is necessary to be such that you, it, it can't be such that you're, if you, if you are really real, that you could be subtract, it could be subtracted from reality and make no difference. And nothing would change. Well, of course, yep. something would change if consciousness were subtracted because then it wouldn't like, be like anything to be us and morality yeah. would collapse because it wouldn't matter how you treated us. Uh, yeah. So I didn't put it very well. I mean, I mean, um, having effect on other things. The right. reason, the rather, you might think this is too quick, but one little argument for why it's false is that here we are talking about conscious oh, right. experience. Now, so they're having effects right now. <laughs> so right now, you could. I but, could actually see what's wrong with that argument. It's, um, well, you it's, could. I, I have a pet theory that I probably won't wind up boring you with today. But 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 one thing that figures into it is the possibility. That consciousness, until you get to a point where you have speech and introspection and talk about it, until that point, it has no causal role. It has, you might say in the history of evolution, it has a kind of latent causality. It's there as a property that doesn't influence things. And then when a species gets to our level, it manifests itself as influential. That's at least a coherent position. I think that, yeah, that's an... That's an important, interesting view. Um, wait, I'm, I'm slipping here. There's something I wanted to say. Oh, yes. I mean, it's a famous problem in the theory of evolution about why we, we don't seem to be able to give an evolutionary explanation of consciousness. Say, take pain as a standard right. example. And we didn't need to actually feel pain. All we needed were certain nat- instinctive reaction, aversive reactions that would do the work just as well. But panpsychism, weak or strong, has an immediate answer to that. It says, sure, but it just so happens that the stuff that things were made out of was already conscious. So you don't need an evolutionary explanation of it. It completely solves that problem. <laughs> In a sense, yeah. Um, it, uh, well, what I just said is, is, is no, I think, no less a solution. I'm not sure solution is the word. I mean, it's still a mystery why the stuff is here. It's just... Uh, well, it, it's just that you're not – what you're emphasizing in a way with the, with the panpsychist view is that, look, don't think of consciousness as something that kind of evolved the way our hands evolved and therefore should have that kind of function. Yeah, it's, it's a little complicated. So um, I do think that all the specific sensory modalities we have, and the eagle's eye and the dog's nose – all they, they did, they're all products of biological evolution. But the fact about evolution is that evolution needs something to work on. So just, I mean, here's a, just as it found bodily shape and worked on that and gave us opposable thumbs and wonderful things like that, so too it found consciousness and worked on that and, and worked it up into vision and hearing and all these wonderfully adaptive um, forms. But... I don't need to explain how it got to be at all. It's just that it was already part of the material mm-hmm. that evolution found. Right. Because you are viewing sentience, even even before animals start talking about it. If you just look at chimpanzees, oh, yeah. you are viewing sentience as playing a causal role. Yeah, but it does it, it does it in a way that doesn't put it in any sort of competition or conflict with, as it were, the kind of causality that neurophysiology and physics will display. Uh, it, what evolution does, it, it's a bit like we build a pocket calculator that does t- multiplication and division. It takes purely physical stuff and make, molds it into a form in which it has it operates effectively in a certain way. That's what evolution did too. Um, it just so happens that the stuff it worked on was already, as it were, consciousness involving. So that's why that's... That's why we have consciousness, and we're not, as they say, zombies, that is, creatures that seem to be as behaviorally sophisticated as we are, but don't actually have any inner life. Right. And that's Um, one of the problems for evolution, that why aren't we zombies in that special philosophical sense of zombie? 
Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, but, but just to, to, uh, to use where we are to put, uh, a kind of a punctuation on, on something we said earlier, the reason epiphenomenalism is not plausible, or one reason it's not coherent to you is that you think if something is real, to, part of the definition of being real is to be part of the causal flow yeah. of things. Yeah. Yeah. I really do think that's perhaps the best general definition. Um, yeah. So of course that just, um, I haven't argued for that, but that just seems to be a, a fundamental idea which, from which it follows that epiphenomenalism couldn't be true. Okay. Um, now do you have, uh, so you adhere to these, again, this strong form of, of, uh, panpsychism according to which, uh, you know, mind or even you might say experience is all there is. It is the fundamental stuff, right? Uh, but it's also, uh, it, it also manifests as a kind of energy, which you think is the stuff of scientific analysis, is the fundamental stuff of scientific analysis. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I mean, I like to quote Stephen Hawking at this point, who, who's, uh, who said, well, what does, what does physics do? What is scientific analysis? He says something like physics is just a series of equations. And then he, he goes on to say, what is it that breathes life into these equations? And that's <laughs> what makes them true. Uh, and physics doesn't answer that question. And here, that's where I say, well, the best hypothesis is that somehow it's consciousness. So how does consciousness being, uh, fundamental and like bedrock stuff, how does that, in what sense does that breathe life into the equation? No, no, it's just a theory about what the ultimate stuff is. Uh, I don't want to, I don't no. want to no, breathe life metaphorically. It, it's the animating stuff. In, I didn't mean breathe life in the sense of, no, I just meant, as it were, make it the case that the equations, which are just bits of abstract math, actually apply to, right. to concrete reality. That's all I meant. I didn't mean life. Um, well, is but, this related to a kind of, um, an interesting thing about scientific laws is that, uh, you know, we say the universe complies with them, but we <laughs> yeah. don't know what enforces the compliance. Uh, you know, you see, that's the language you used earlier, which I completely reject. <laughs> terrible, terrible. I call it separatism, this terrible picture. Here's matter sitting around, and uh, as it were, God made that, and now he thinks, hmm, what laws shall I make it obey? And then he clunks on the laws on top, and now makes them. Uh, it's it's constitutive of the very being or nature of the matter. The law you don't need to add laws. It's just right. given the nature of the stuff, they behave as they do. I have to say, one of the people who's really good about this is Nietzsche. Um, brilliant, quite brilliant. <laughs> yeah, you, he's, yeah. Other people have lauded him, um, but the uh, but you are saying right. I mean, what I was going to say was, isn't for you, consciousness, in a certain sense, a version of the answer to the question, what enforces, I don't mean enforces, like walks around enforcing complaint. It is the animating stuff that, that it, 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 real, it, it, it is, it is the reason the physical laws are realized. It is. Yes, I, I, I mean, I get it. I get what you're saying, but I just somehow don't want to say that as, um, but to, Suppose we go back to the traditional view, which the ultimate nature of the physical world is non-conscious. That's already animated. It's already energetic and animated. Yeah, right. And it has a certain character. It has the character that, as it were, if you like, was dictated at the Big Bang, if we accept the story of the Big Bang. Something banged into existence. Something, what banged into existence? Something with a certain nature, given which it could not but behave as it does. So all that, they can have, all the animating can be had without the panpsychism. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, here's a view about the nature of the stuff that it's not non-conscious. It's, it's already somehow consciousness involving. And I should say what, well, just now that I, I haven't really sort of positively committed myself to this view. I just think that it's on classical grounds of theoretical elegance, parsimony, simplicity, and so on. It's the most plausible view. Mm -hmm. That's my official position. Okay, let me ask you if this is uh, one way, if maybe this is a, a chain of logic that either has led you to your view or could, in a certain sense, lead to it, which is the following. 
You don't like the idea that there's some threshold that's crossed where all of a sudden matter, it, it achieves some configuration that infuses it with consciousness. That seems yeah. a little weird. And so uh, maybe the easiest way, if you don't want there to be any threshold, you are almost... Uh, you're almost inexorably led to some kind of panpsychism, right? That's right. Exactly. And, and, and if you, if you held to the, so, so at that point, if not, if no threshold means you are led to a panpsychism, you have to choose between kind of soft or weak panpsychism and the stronger version. And you don't like the soft version because that amounts to, when you, when, when you look at it in the context of human consciousness, that kind of amounts to epiphenomenalism, right? Which yes. you don't like for other reasons. Yes. And, and so, and so you're I, left with I, what? Yeah, a lot of things I don't like. Right. So, so you're left with kind of almost logically a strong form of panpsychism. Listen, I want to, if you, if you permit, I'd like to read out a brief quotation from William James, which I brought up on the screen here, because he makes this point very clearly okay. about, about discontinuity. So he says, the fact is, I quote, that discontinuity comes in if a new nature comes in at all. Uh, the quantity of the latter is quite immaterial. He's talking about consciousness arising from non-consciousness. Mm -hmm. And he says, the girl in the play Midship Midshipman Easy could not excuse the illegitimacy of her child by saying it was a very small one. And consciousness, however small, is an illegitimate birth in any philosophy that starts without it and yet professes to explain all facts by continuous evolution. So there's the case. Mm -hmm. He said it. Mm -hmm. 1890. I have nothing really to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I can imagine, uh, rebuttals, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, I mean, but then the problem is, <laughs> the problem is like conceiving what strong panpsychism is like. It's just so radically at odds with our intuition, right? Well, our intuition, what is, intuitions have been trained a certain way. That's where the argument about, about what physics doesn't talk about. I call it the silence of physics. Physics mm -hmm. is, that's, that's a term that Russell used. Physics is completely silent. So when you see that, you realize that it was just a prejudice or presupposition, an assumption that the ultimate nature of stuff was non-experiential. It has no, no scientific or theoretical warrant at all. All you, you just, it's just, you know, we stub our toes mm -hmm. on things and we think, well, that's not, <laughs> that's the physical, that's non-conscious. But it's about as bad as thinking that we, when we know what solidity is just by stubbing our toes. In fact, it's electric charge. It's utterly different from, from what we might intuitively imagine. And it's the same move. The intuit, you're right about the intuition, but the intuition has no warrant. That's the point. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I have to admit, there's there's no intuitively uh compelling view of consciousness that doesn't run into serious problems. <laughs> I mean that's the yeah, uh yeah. and then the problem with the other kind is that they're not intuitively uh apprehensible. So uh but um Let so, me just try it let me try it on you. I say, why do you think that there is any non experiential, non conscious stuff at all? Where's your evidence? Show me some evidence. And I answer, there is zero evidence. Well, there is, but there is the problem of, of, well, what you, if you don't mean it's like something to be the thing that is conscious, then what do you mean? If you're not saying that it's like something to be a rock, but you're saying it's conscious, what does it mean to say it's conscious? No, I do mean that. There's something it's like to be it. A rock. I mean, I, no, no, not the rock. Not the rock, rock, but the little <laughs> stuff. Yeah. What is yeah. it like? Tell us. Oh, it's sort of like this. <laughs> It's a very dull, kind of yeah. undifferentiated sentence. Yeah. Though, I mean, I'm sometimes, you know, this is sort of material for my enemies, as it were. I'm sometimes attracted by the idea that there's affect right at the bottom and there's kind of attraction and repulsion, as we say. <laughs> well, but might... you see, now that, now, now see, that's the thing is like, it, it, you say that the idea of, uh, of a threshold is implausible to you, but there, there is a pretty distinct threshold with the emergence of life, which is that very thing, which does seem to be associated with sentience, which is that living systems are attracted to things that are nourishing or conducive to their survival and reproduction, and they are aversive to things that are bad for them, and that seems to be the origin of organic uh, affect, at least, 
you have good feelings about food and stuff and bad feelings about toxins and predators. Yeah, so so that's easy. Evolution finds conscious a sort of consciousness base and tunes it in a way that it's that makes it serve those functions. Now you could say that affect is what makes the molecules of a rock stick together. They have a positive no, feeling I, about each other. I wasn't really wasn't it's not really it's not totally crazy. No, you know, I, there are some physical things repel each other and some things attract each other. I, I don't I, I actually look, if you're gonna buy if you're gonna buy into panpsychism, I almost think you might as well go here. And and, 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 and I mean seriously, it it, it 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 seems to make the whole thing more kind of, you know, comprehensively coherent. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Now, I, I, do you, do, uh, you know, do you know the work of Teilhard de Chardin? Uh, he's, he was a theologian more than a philosopher. How do you, I didn't get the name. Teilhard de Chardin, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Oh, uh, no. Oh. Uh, yeah. Well, he talked about the interiority and the exteriority and so on. Um, but anyway, he was a, more of a theologian than a philosopher. Um, so do you have allies? Uh, yeah. Um, and probably some people who think I don't go far enough. So, for example, um, there's my my student, um, ex-student, I should say, Philip Goff, who uh, now teaches at the Central European University, who's just published a book called Consciousness and Fundamental Reality. He goes for something called cosmopsychism. Uh, that sounds pretty... pretty uh, and I think that I actually... I've always entertained that possibility, too, that, um, you know, as you probably know, given the kinds of interviews you do, there are quite a lot of highly distinguished cosmologists nowadays who think that really the universe is a single thing in some really deep sense. Mm. Um, so, I mean, a simple version of that is something Steven Weinberg said 20 years ago, that st- according to string theory, particles are really rips in space-time, and space-time is the only thing there is. So, on that view, there's only one thing, and uh, it's, it's, as it were, consciousnessing away, and we're just little pockets of it. And this is very like Spinoza, I should also say. Um, but so that's an ally. I mean, I, as you probably also know, Dave Chalmers is, has been flirting heavily with something like this. For David some flirts with a lot of things. <laughs> and, um, who, uh, well, what's, what's one of the things most interesting to me is that a hundred years ago, I think the discussion of the mind-body problem was much better, and there was a very widely accepted I mean, view. So the, the father of Wilfred Sellers, uh, R.W. Sellers, said, you know, panpsychism has to be considered as a version of naturalism. There was Whitehead, who was very influential in the States. There's Eddington. Russell is definitely open to the view. There are two very interesting American philosophers from that time called C.A. Strong and Durant Drake, who are also panpsychists, mm-hmm. and, and, and of the same general kind. By the way, a, do you know, is David Chalmers flirting with the soft form or the strong form of panpsychism? Uh, actually, I think his current preference is for something he calls pan-protopsychism, which is just a view that it, it tries to adjust the, as I understand it, it tries to adjust the standard conception of the physical. It says, no, the phys- physical has properties that aren't accounted for in physics, which means that it's as essentially well predisposed towards giving rise to consciousness, but it, there isn't, it isn't actually already conscious. But to me, that's just, that seems like just a variant on the common view that if evolution produced consciousness and there was something about matter which meant that when evolution took place, Consciousness arose. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, Nagel has always been, well, he wrote a famous, valuable paper in the 70s, and then in his book, Mind, was it called Mind and Cosmos, published about five years ago. I think that's right. Years. Again, he's not going to commit to it, but he, you know, he's, he's certainly um, a friend. He's an amicus, as it were, of the general movement. Mm-hmm. Without and the other person, I think, who's been very sort of insightful about this is, uh, Rebecca Goldstein, um, partly in her fiction and, and but also in her um, more formal books. Well, she's a Spinoza fan. Yes, yes, that's true. But I think she kind of got it um, long ago. And then, funnily enough, she's actually thanked in the in Nagel's 1970, I think 1979 paper. So, hmm. Hmm. yeah, she was a student of his at Princeton. I yes. Yes. I mean, no, no other names are coming to mind, but I think there's, 
I think they're, they're, it's kind of big in Germany too. Hmm. And there may be reasons in there, as it were, history for that. So does this uh, influence your life? Um, no. I although, mean, aside from leading to academic disputes, does it, does, it, does it influence the way you go about looking at the world? No, but when it really dawned on me that um, we don't know the nature of the physical in such a way that um, we have good reason to think it's wholly non-conscious, that, was, that, was, that shook me up. It happened in the, in the 90s, um, and it was sort of changed my life for Wait, about Wait, you mean weeks. you realize there's no way of knowing that in a, so-called inanimate reality is not conscious? Just... Uh, our deep, deep ignorance of the ultimate nature of stuff. And That's again, for sure. say, the, uh, but there is one thing we really do know about it. The only thing we really know about its intrinsic nature is consciousness. And so I like it when Russell says things like, um, this is pretty much a quotation, we know nothing about the intrinsic nature of the physical except when we have experiences. That's our uh, one insight into the art. Uh, you mean we, we know from personal experience that at least some con configurations of matter can manifest as consciousness? Yeah. Yeah. Once, you're, once you've committed to being a physicalist or materialist of some sort, you have to say that. Mm -hmm. It's related to what Descartes said about, you know, I, I, the one thing you know, except he said, you know that you exist because you are thinking. No, he also said that you know you know the quality, the immediate present qualitative character of your experience. He said, so he imagines, uh, he says, I seem to see, I don't know, a stove, but I am dreaming, so this is false. No, but I certainly seem to see, and this cannot be false. The point is that that seeming to see is already conscious experience. So if, you know, it's, so I suppose you someone says I, says, I look at a red wall and I see red, and someone says, no, you don't. You seem to see red, but you don't really. You're hallucinating. Fine. But try try that move again. Someone says, you don't see even seem to see red. You seem to seem to see red. Mm -hmm. And then ask yourself, what's that like? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, it just would already be like seeing red. You So, sorry, that wasn't very well put. But the point is, you cannot open up a gap between what, how things seem and how they are in this particular case. Hmm. Pain is a better example. So if you seem, someone hypnotizes you to feel, to be convinced you're in great pain, you are in great pain. Right. There's no, the seeming is the thing. There's no appearance reality gap. That's why we can know that consciousness is real and what it's like, I would say. Because it seems to exist. And in the subjective yeah, realm, seeming yeah. is being. Exactly. And that's why, that's what's wrong with illusionism. It says, well, it seems to exist, but it doesn't really. Um, and, I, and then I say, no, but the seeming is already... You mean illusionism, the view that consciousness is an illusion yes. and doesn't exist? That's right. Yeah, yeah. It, don't get you me started cannot. on that. It's silly. I mean, yeah, but, uh, but uh, the... Uh, so did you... Um, I mean, so this thing in the 90s, was this like a big epiphany? This was like... There, there, there was kind of a threshold there for you where this, this, where panpsychism per se was suddenly appealing? I'd already, I sort of argued my way, but then, I did, yes, no, it just, it wasn't even that at that point. It was just a kind of real experience of not, not knowing, mm -hmm. except knowing only at the consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I, wanting to be a physicalist, committing to physicalism, and realizing the only thing I know for sure about it is, what I know when I have conscious experience. Mm -hmm. So just to make sure people understand, uh, you consider your view totally compatible with, in a sense, a completely scientific worldview, or at least everything that science tells us with any confidence you believe we should have confidence in. Um, it's just there's this, this other side to reality that you think is uh, not only compatible with science, but um, maybe in some sense helps make sense of it. I don't know. Is that... Yes, it is correct. And, and I think this, this view was fully on the table throughout the first half of the 20th century. It got blasted off the table. I think in the fifties, um, and disappeared from view. Mm -hmm. And that's back. <laughs> okay. Well, we're, we're at an hour, so we should call it a day. I do want to just revisit one thing and, and kind of, uh, clarify one thing where when I said we don't know what enforces the laws, 
Okay. And you took that to be a kind of a move toward theism. Uh, l- let me use this analogy. Oh, oh, I didn't. Okay, okay. But anyway, you, you said the idea of some kind of universal policeman or something, whatever, uh, you know, so that, 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 what, oh, what? yeah, it's true. I talked about God clamping on the laws. Right, right. Well, that was just a, a metaphor. What I meant was, don't, e- you know, even in the wholly atheistic conception, don't mm-hmm. think of that stuff and then there's laws. The, the laws, as it were, are, the, are just the being of the stuff. They're mm-hmm. built right into the being of the stuff. And the, you couldn't have the same stuff in different laws. Um, you couldn't have the same stuff in different laws. Okay, I'll ponder that. Let, let me say that another way of, of just saying what I was trying to say is like, you know, if you look at a, a computer program or say the form of a computer program that is a video game and say you're in some sense in the video game and trying to figure out the laws of the video game, in principle, you could do that. You could discern all the causal relations uh, probably in principle, but what you could not know from inside the video game, so to speak. In other words, you might be able to go, well, here's the whole program. You could write the whole program for your video game. And in a certain sense, that's what science is doing with the universe. But if you were in that video game, you wouldn't understand that beneath the programming are these laws of physics that the program harnesses, right? The if-then statements actually work because they are implemented in a way that draws on the tendencies of electrons. But you wouldn't know about the electrons. And and, and the electrons are what enforce those laws, in a sense. Sure. I, I accept. I can accept the metaphor. I, yeah. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and and does your and and in your view does consciousness fit into it in any in any way that is analogous to the electrons in that analogy? Well, I just again I just want to say conscious experience is the stuff. The stuff is constituted in its being by what you call the laws. Um the the they're not separate from the stuff they're just built into it. So I think okay. I left wanting something there. Okay, <laughs> well maybe we will uh leave it there and uh maybe come back and revisit this or related matter. I mean, for example, you said you're a moral realist and we didn't even get into that. Right. So but thank you so much, Galen. I mean we should say that you think you you either know you have a fever or think you have one. And you know in a way, it's like subjective experience. If you think you have a fever, <laughs> you, you, you just might as well have one uh, if it feels like it. So thanks a lot for uh, taking the time. And let's do this again. Thanks. It was fun. Okay.